Good morning, and welcome to Harmony Grove United Methodist Church on this Sunday, October 11th, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. And I would like to thank those of you who have been able to show up today, despite the fact that many of our roads are closed this morning due to a train derailment last night uh, on the tracks nearby and some folks who evacuated. So hopefully tonight, uh, today, I'm going to keep people like Jeff on his toes, who was up uh, since very early morning. And, uh, but thank you for being here. I also want to thank uh, Mike and Jim, who have spent their morning down in our basement uh, vacuuming up some of the water that uh, leaked in last night. Uh, so we had a spill. So they're th thanks to those guys for that. But I am delighted to see you here today and delighted for those of us joining us on Facebook Live. At this time, let us uh, just say a word of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord our God as we enter this time of worship. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord God, this year has been full of trials. And just here locally, we had some last night. Yet, Lord, we know that all things uh, are under your guidance. All of us are under your protection. All of us are loved by you. And we can always turn to you and know that you are our God and we are your children. We thank you for this house of worship. Be with us now as we enter this time of worship that we might lift our spirits up to you uh, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now at this time I want to ask those who are here in person to stand and not sing. <laughs> But this is a hard one not to sing out, to belt out. This is the day that the Lord has made. But just be mindful uh, not to project your voices. You can hum along, but please stand and join. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. I have a question for you. Have you ever been invited to a birthday party that wasn't for you? What are some of the things you did to get ready for that party? Maybe you made or brought some food. Maybe you bought a gift and wrapped it. Those are all very thoughtful things you did. Another thing that you did that maybe you don't think about too much is that you made the time and effort to be at that party. Because you can't be at that party in another party in a completely different place at the same time, can you? In today's scripture lesson, Jesus tells us the story of how the kingdom of God is like a party. But in that story, even though there's a really great party happening, there are still a lot of people that say they won't go to the party.
The reasons that people give for not going to the party are they think that it won't be fun, they think it's not important, and they are planning to do other things instead. Because of those reasons, the invited guests do not go to the party that they were invited to. Then Jesus said, it's really too bad these people chose not to attend. They're gonna miss a really big and exciting party and everyone is invited to this party. This invitation, by the way, includes you, me, everyone in our congregation, everyone in the whole world. We are all invited to God's party. But, and this is really important, we have to remember that though parties are fun, there are some things that we have to do to get ready for them. The way we get ready for the Kingdom of God's party is learning how to be at God's party. We learn how to be at God's party by reading and talking about the scripture stories. By coming to worship. And by talking to and listening to God, we call that prayer. You can do it alone or with other people. As we keep doing these things, we start to see and understand that God's party is happening right here and right now in the life that we're living. And once we start to see and know that God's party is happening right here and right now, then we start to see and know how to live and to be at God's party. When we know how to live God's party, then we know how to share God's party by inviting others and helping them see how to attend. And that is the good news for today. God is having a great party and we're all invited to it. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who teaches us about your party, the kingdom of God. Please help us live and share your party. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Gretchen. At this time in our service, we are going to uh, provide our offering. And so those of you who are home uh, know that you can uh, pay online. Uh, also, too, if you're sitting there going, I didn't send in my check this month. Now's the time to write it. Those of you sitting here, uh, be mindful that uh, as you come and go into the uh, sanctuary, there are uh, some uh, stands for giving your tithes and offerings. You can do that uh, coming and going. So at this time, let us thank God for all the many good things he has blessed us with. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all things. You are the creator. You are the sustainer. And Lord God, we know that one day we all shall enter into that party. And Lord God, we know that it will be a time of rejoicing. Lord God, we pray for this church. We pray for all those who are in need of your love. And Lord, we thank you for the many ways in which you've blessed us. Uh, we pray that you will use this part that we give back to you for the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
gentle God has guided your flock from age to age. Your faithfulness is written on history's open page. Our fathers owned your goodness, and we their deeds record. And both to this bears witness, one church, one faith, one Lord. Your heralds brought the gospel to greatest and the least. They summoned men and women to share the great king's feast. And this was all their teaching in every deed and word to all alike proclaiming one church, one faith, one Lord. Your mercy will not fail us nor leave your work undone. With your right hand to help us, the victory shall be won. And then by earth and heaven, your name shall be adored. And this shall be our anthem, one church, one faith, one Lord. Good morning. Our lay Bible reading for today is from Exodus 32, 1 through 14. This is from the New Revised Standard Version. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us as for this Moses? the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know that what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow should be a festival to the Lord. There rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, excuse me, Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham. Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, 
I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lynn, for that reading. <clears throat> As you noticed in that story, chair, prayer changed God's mind. At this time, we are going to go and have a word of prayer for us, this congregation, for this church, and for our nation. Those of you at home and perhaps on our screen, I'm not sure, uh, or at least in the bulletin, you will see a list of those for whom we are praying. Please be mindful of them and pray for them uh, during this time uh, and also during the week. Uh, let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that we can just turn to you and know that somehow, some way, perhaps in your time, but all we need to do is trust and everything will be okay. Perhaps not in the way we would like it to be, but Lord, we know that you are our God and that you love us with a love that goes beyond our comprehension and that you are a giver of good things. And Lord God, even when we are fearful and afraid and unsure of the future and may turn to other gods or other things that entice us, that promise us strength, that promise us salvation, Lord, if we turn from you, we miss out on your glory and your love for us. As the people of Israel turn to the bulls and idols that they had fashioned, they missed out on your love. And Lord God, we thank you that Moses was able to intercede on their behalf and that, Lord, we can intercede on behalf of others that things might change for them. You are a God of grace, a God of mercy, and we thank you for all the many ways in which you love us. Lord God, be mindful of those who are on our prayer list. You know their needs, those who are uh, waiting for surgery, those who are undergoing various treatments, those who are waiting on test results those who are grieving the loss of a one, uh, loved one, those who are lonely, be with them all, comfort them. Help us as a church to be mindful of how to care for one another, how to reach out, how to let people know that we are there for them. And Lord God, we pray for our leaders uh, regionally, locally, in the state, nationally, throughout the world, Lord, that you would guide them with wisdom, guide them with compassion. And that, Lord God, you would provide for them counselors among whom they can find wisdom and make good choices on behalf of those whom they've been called to lead. Lord God, we also pray for this world that is so oftentimes devastated by natural events such as uh, the hurricanes that continue to batter our southern and eastern shoreline and the fires that are raging out west. And Lord God, if if there is anything that we can do, whether uh, the weather is changing through natural or because of human involvement, Lord, we know that we are, need, we are in need of being good stewards of this world. So help us to be mindful at all times how to protect this environment, how to give to our children a gift of a beautiful world where they can not be afraid to breathe, to drink the water, to eat the food knowing that they too will hand it down to their descendants even better than the ones they received. You are a good and gracious God, and we thank you for all things. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me 
lying in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul, and I will trust I will in trust. you. I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows, your goodness will lead me on. He guides my way. anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on his pure delights, and I will trust in you. I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me home. And though I want I hear an amen. That was just beautiful. Thank you so much. Beautiful. At this time, I'd like to ask you to stand for the reading of the gospel, uh, which this morning is taken from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Here are these words. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, 
while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You want to know something, folks? I just read that out of the New Testament. Those were Jesus' words. That's right. We have a commonly held perception sometimes and belief that the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament are somehow different. The God of the Old Testament is one of judgment, wrath, and violence, whereas the God of the New Testament is a God of love, mercy, and grace. The Old Testament is filled with violence. Stories of killing people, sparing no one, destroying cities, all based on God's commands to the people of Israel. Skeptics will often point to these stories to use them against the humanity of Christianity, to counteract our expressions of love for one another. And sometimes they have a point. It's really hard to defend God as portrayed in many of these Old Testament stories. We don't like having a God who is judgmental, wrathful, and violent. And one of our favorite ways to defend our God against these accusations is to say that our understanding of God is based on the New Testament and not on the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. In the New Testament, God is portrayed as loving, merciful, kind, and full of forgiveness. We point to stories like the prodigal son. We point out the greatest two commandments, love of God and love of your neighbor. We point out the letters John that speak so eloquently of God's love for us and how we are to love one another. We even point to Paul sometimes in his epistle to Corinthians where he speaks so beautifully of love in 1 Corinthians 13. We point to the life and teaching of Jesus himself, which are filled with acts of love, not only for those he cared about, but even for those who were mean to him. And finally, we point out that we are commanded to turn our cheek if struck and to love our enemy. It seems so clear and simple for us. Our God is a God of love and mercy, not a God of wrath and judgment. And then we are confronted with a text like the one we read today. It is a text that would fit in well if it were in the Old Testament, let's say in those conquest narratives of Joshua and Judges. But it's not only in the New Testament, it's not even in the writings of Paul, but in the Gospels. And if you had a red letter edition, this would be red letters for us, Jesus himself speaking to us in this parable, describing the kingdom of heaven, which normally for us is like a mustard seed. We've planted it, grows to a vast tree. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is more like the, you know, the, the lost sheep where the shepherd goes looking for them. That's our idea of the kingdom of heaven, not this kind of story about the kingdom of heaven where God is killing people and throwing someone out where there's gnashing of teeth because he's not dressed properly. What do we do with our image of God as merciful and kind when he is portrayed as being vengeful and destructive? As it says, the king which in this parable stands for God, was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Now, one could argue that he only killed the murderers, as it says, who may have deserved it. But then he also turned around and burned their whole city. <laughs> I imagine there were a few innocent people in that city. But the part that really gets me is at the end, after the hall is filled with all the local riffraff like you and me, the king notices a man who's not wearing the proper clothes, which in this case is a wedding outfit. And did he give this poor guy any slack, thinking that maybe the only clothes he owned were the ones he was wearing? No. 
The king, that is God, had him bound hand and foot and thrown into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I just love that expression, gnashing of teeth. That's, you know, there's the, there's the fire and brimstone to keep Jeff awake. The gnashing of teeth. Right. Really? Is this, is this for real? Just for wearing the wrong outfit? This is the New Testament, right? We're all in the New Testament. The Gospels, aren't we? This is Jesus speaking. You know, that kind, gentle, approachable friend. This kind of, this Jesus? What's going on here? How do we make sense of this? Thrown out at us as a reading Deal with it, folks. How do we deal with this? How do we make sense? Well, one thing we could do is just disregard it. Pretend it's not there or that's a mistake. We're good at ignoring the facts that don't fit in with our view of things. And this is a fact that does not fit in with our view of the God of the New Testament being merciful and kind. So let's just ignore it. Wish we could, but we can't. The second option would be to look for another example of this story in one of the other Gospels, one of the parallel Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, sometimes John, uh, and see if we could use this one, the other one, instead of the one right here. Well, and instead of ignoring the facts, we'll modify them to align more correctly with our views based on perhaps that other reading. And luckily, we can do this because the story is found elsewhere in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 14. And in this telling of the parable, the people who are invited uh, provide various excuses like, you know, I just got a new piece of property, I need to go check it out. I got a new cow, I need to go milk or whatever, get, you know. I, I got a new wife, I got to go be with. You know, they gave all these excuses and, okay, fine, you know, no problem. So they turn to the riffraff, like us, and, the, you know, the good and the bad, and they bring them all in, and no one gets killed at the end for wearing, you know, the wrong clothes. It's a more gentler, kinder take on this parable and we could certainly use that if we wanted to no one's killed and this fits better with our view of things so let's go with this story and pretend Matthew just got it wrong maybe he was having a bad day when he wrote this down who knows you know it's hard sometimes trying to make God fit in with our view of things instead of changing our view of things Instead of admitting that maybe we are wrong to think and believe the way we do, we deny any contradictory facts or we force them to conform to our own view. We would rather crawl over a mile of broken glass than admit we might be wrong. Those with ears to hear, let them hear. Well, we are not going to do that today, at least not today. We're going to try and make sense of this story. Not by denying or changing the facts, but by changing our view of God and the Bible. Could it be that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the very same God? I would argue they are. And the difference between the portrayal of God in the Old Testament and God in the New Testament is not due to a change in God, but to a change in the audience. In the Old Testament times, God was carving out a niche for the people he loved who lived in the midst of a vicious tribal society at first, and then in the midst of warring city-states, and finally in the middle of vast empires vying for supremacy. Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Assyrians, all crumbling, trying to get that piece of land where these little petty kings were trying to hang on desperately to their little piece of land. It was a vicious world, and it was very cruel, and the gods who existed in that world were themselves vicious, vindictive, wrathful, and slow to forgive. But not all the gods. Some gods, it's a polytheistic society, right? Many gods. Not all the gods were vindictive, wrathful, warring gods. Some gods were kind and loving and were worshipped for their ability to heal. Some were known for their soft, soft and gentle rains, bringing fertility to the earth and to people. Some were gods of music, gods of joy, gods of feasting, gods of springing water, gods of clouds floating gently across the blue skies, gods of the flowers and trees and all that is beautiful and blooms. There were gods for everything, everything beautiful, everything bold, everything 
different in the world had a divine attribute to it and was attributed to a, to a God, to a divine being as the source of that power within whatever that item was. Whether it was the water that sprang and gave life, there must be a divine force in that. Whether it was the, the rains that brought fertility, there, fertility, there must have been a divine force in that. And so, but the gods who conquered others and who rose to power were vicious <laughs> and often required that those who conquered in their name to be vicious as well. All the various elements in heaven and earth were attributed to the various gods as divine attributes. From wrathful and vicious to soft and loving, all were distributed among all the various gods. And it was into the middle of this world that Yahweh, the God of Israel, revealed himself as the one and true and only God. All of those divine attributes, once distributed among all the various gods, are now all contained in the one true and only God, Yahweh. And at this time, when Yahweh was busy helping the people of Israel carve out a niche for themselves, these people whom he loved and called forth out of slavery to a land of their own, when he was helping them create that niche in a vicious and terrible world, his more warlike attributes came to the fore to help serve this people in a vicious and cruel world. But the softer attributes, the loving, merciful, forgiving, and healing attributes of God were still there. And we find expressions of these attributes in many places throughout the Old Testament. For example, Psalms 23, which was beautifully sung in this new arrangement. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. That's a beautiful image of God as a loving and merciful, kind, healing God. That God is present in the Old Testament, but more of the background. And just as the kinder attributes of God are found in the Old Testament, so the more wrathful, judgmental attributes of God are found in the New Testament. The difference is one of emphasis. The world in which Jesus lived was still a vicious world, but it was more stable with empires that could still be cruel, but that also provided rules and order and that understood justice tempered with mercy had a place in maintaining social order. And in this world, Jesus, as a teacher, as a prophet, and as the Son of God, wove a new tapestry of God. This new tapestry he wove, however, used the same threads or attributes that already existed in the Old Testament. But he emphasized some threads, the kinder, gentler, and loving threads, over the other threads that were darker, more judgmental. As an example, just think of Jesus as the Messiah. What kind of Messiah were they looking for? The conqueror, the king, who would put everyone else in their place, who would lead them in a revolution and, and would do all this stuff. But which thread did he pick out of that? No, he picked a gentler, nicer Messiah who would suffer for their behalf. Same tapestry, different threads. He picked out these because they fit him and the audience and they were true of God as they have always been true of God. He did not exclude the darker, more judgmental and wrathful threads in this new tapestry. No, he did not. But they formed the background in this new tapestry in the New Testament, whereas previously in the Old Testament, they formed the foreground. Same tapestry, different picture, same threads woven differently. So what does it all mean when we finally center on this text? And I'll admit, I don't really like it, but here it is. It's either that we ignore the facts, deny them, or change our world view, I would much rather ignore the facts and then change my views. But it means that being a Christian means that there are consequences to our choices and actions, and that in the final analysis, God will hold us accountable. There, I've said it. This is the theological thread that contradicts that universal salvation I may have been talking about a couple weeks ago. Remember, when I talked about everyone could be saved? I do like that thread better. But here's just as valid a thread that talks about consequences, retribution for our actions. 
and that we need to be mindful how to weave them both together. Being a Christian is not all lovey-dovey, easy-peasy. All will be forgiven, so why worry about sin kind of religion? That's the kind we like. But there are consequences to our choices, brothers and sisters, that we must be mindful of. And one day we will be held accountable for those choices. And based on this story, I think Jesus is telling us that though we may think we are entitled to mercy, grace, and forgiveness, we still have to show gratitude. Right? Gratitude is the first lesson being pointed at here. Responding to the invitation of the king and showing up at his son's wedding feast is a sign of gratitude for all we have been given. We are not entitled to be invited to that wedding feast. It is a gift for which we should show gratitude. Do you know what gratitude is? Do you show gratitude? And how do you show your gratitude to God? I also think this story is illustrating a very underused, antiquated, and disrespected attribute within not only our current society, but in all societies that have generational differences. That attribute of which I speak, and, and which is illustrated in this story of the poor guy who was tossed out for not wearing a wedding outfit, is respect. That's right, Aretha Franklin had it right. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect, just a little bit, is all she's asking for, respect. Now, generally, when speaking of respect, we think of the older generation telling the younger generation to show more respect to their elders. Or we think of those in power telling those who threaten their power to show respect in order to protect the status quo. But no, that's not what I'm talking about here. Showing respect is about all generations, about all people, about all societies, about all groups of people who have differences to respect one another. And not to diss one another. Ain't nobody got time to be dissed. I believe this world could use some more gratitude and respect. Old-fashioned, perhaps, but it's in our Bible, and we've got to deal with it, whether we like it or not. And not showing gratitude and respect has consequences, not only for society, but for our own soul as well, as our gospel story <laughs> makes clear. Just show a little bit of respect. Be mindful of others. You never know what path they've walked. Be respectful. Show gratitude. God knows that. God has always known that. And now we know that. As God reminds us today in this parable, whether we like it or not. So in conclusion, express gratitude in all things, especially to God. And respect others, regardless of your differences. Amen. Okay, now at this time we would like to ask you to stand and not sing. <laughs> That's going to be my new thing to say. To stand and uh, uh, hear our song and, and, and hum along with Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Oh. 
Just a few announcements before our benediction. Um, uh, we have the Monday morning, we will not have the Monday morning check-in this week, and the office will be closed on Monday. Uh, it's Columbus Day, and so uh, we decided to close the office, and there will not be that Monday morning check-in at 11. We will have the Wednesday night Bible study at 6.30 uh, by way of Zoom. We continue to have the Friday uh, men's coffee group meeting here at the church over at the Labyrinth at 8 a.m., so all men are welcome for that. Uh, also, too, we would like to mention the Fall Bazaar, right? Uh, we have a craft show coming on October 31st. It's going to be a big day here. We really want some help and some uh, folks to be present here. Uh, there's many ways you can uh, volunteer and help with this. Uh, the craft show will be from 9 to 1. Uh, so if you, have, if you have a craft you want to sell, uh, bring that. Or if you know a vendor who has a craft, let them know. Also, too, later in the afternoon, between 4 and 5, we will have something very fun and new. It will be a drive through trunk or treat. We will line up the cars with their trunks open, uh, and, uh, and the people will drive through that, and we will give them candy as they come through. So what do we need from you all as congregants? We need candy, so please bring candy. We also, if possible, would like you to bring your car <laughs> and open your trunk, whether it's decorated or not. If you know anyone who has a classic car, that might be a fun time for them. Uh, if you have a Vespa, you know, uh, bring that and open the, the boot in the back, whatever, to give candy to folks. Um, and so, also, too, I think Andrew has a, sh a short announcement. Yeah, again, like last week, uh, choir started. It starts at 2 o'clock, and the Zoom link is the same as last week. If you are interested, even if you haven't been in choir before, come join us, and the link is on the constant contact for anyone that's interested. And now for our benediction. Know that you are loved. There is so little asked of us in return, but we do owe God our gratitude, and we need to learn to respect one another, for it's simply a sign of love. Go forth knowing that you are loved fully as you are, and love one another. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Now, go ahead. Now, now please leave at the discretion or the direction of your ushers.